what was posed to us was you have a million dollars or less that your family has and you have a small child that wants to invest in the habitat conservation for tigers or elephants or rhinos, how do you create an investment that allows you to make small retail investments in something like this and actually earn some kind of rate of return and get your money back? And I think one of the, two of the things that came out very early in our conversation that were important were identifying where your cash flow might come from. Um, so in order to preserve tiger habitat, nobody was an expert by any stretch of the imagination in our group, but we assumed there'd have to be some land conservation activity. So you might have to purchase land or use a conservation easement or something of that sort, and that costs money. That's what your bond, that's the use of your funding in that case. So what are your potential sources of repayment? One of the ideas that came up from our group from Paul was that there might be a foundation that's willing to buy some of these tiger habitat outcomes. There could be development financial institutions. We could work with donor advised funds were talked about quite a bit in our group. Um, thinking about those different groups as maybe initial payers that would say, hey, we wanna see if this works on a smaller pilot scale and we'll cover those costs and make a return for investors in that case. But we need to show a sustainable path to something that's larger than that. One of the really cool ideas that's already in place that was brought up for this are uh, tourism fees or airport fees. You pay a dollar or five dollars, whatever it happens to be when you land in India or Nepal to save the tiger habitat. And that could be a longer term source of repayment, but you wanna make sure whatever intervention that you're doing on the ground actually works. One of the other points that came up that was really important is who is your trusted NGO that actually understands tiger conservation or tiger habitat and understands as an honest broker what needs to happen on the ground so that what is the right intervention that gets you the outcomes that you're looking for and making sure that group is involved as a stakeholder was really important too. I don't think we ended up on any final structure necessarily, but I think the key takeaways here were understanding what are your costs in terms of order of magnitude, what are your potential cash flows, and then what does this look like at an initial sort of pilot stage and what could it ultimately grow into? So why don't I pause there. Paul, do you want to fill in things that I've missed or? or yeah. yeah. yeah no. uh, and the Tiger Bank, thanks. I think we didn't really touch on, so. That's right. Thanks, uh, yeah. thanks, Zach. No, I think, I think you got, got, got most of it there. I think there were two, two maybe other points uh, that we had. Um, one is, you know, why do a bond at all? Why, why not just, you know, collect money from, from philanthropists? And you, you know, the, 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 the powerful thing about bonds, or, is that they shift resources from the future back to the present. And conservation is something that's immediate. It's something that's present. You know, we're, we've, I think we've just lost the white rhino in Kenya. Who knows what's happening with, with Tigger or Tiger here. Um, if you do it in a slow way, you may not achieve your conservation goals. What a bond would allow you to do is to, to let's, say you, let's say you've got a philanthropist who is willing to commit a million dollars to this cause. You could say to that philanthropist, you've got two options. One is we can take your one million dollars and use it today to try to conserve Tigger's environment. Or two, we could take your million dollars and use it as the interest on a bond. And if you do that, it would leverage that money to a much, much larger extent today. You could potentially raise $10 million, $20 million, use the philanthropist money to pay back the interest, and then uh, deploy that money today and really try to solve um, the problem that you're, you know, you're concerned about. We see increasingly across the uh, nonprofit landscape a desire not to have perpetual endowments, not to have perpetual uh, funds. We, the Gates Foundation is going to sunset at a certain time. We're seeing a little bit of uh, pushback against donor advised funds where people are just parking money there and not actually doing anything with them. In many cases, the causes that we care about are immediate and you want to try to deploy uh, the money today. Um, one other point that uh, Zach made, which I think was very powerful, is, is that uh, when you have a cause like this, especially if you have a cuddly tiger, uh, you can often incentivize a, a giver or a philanthropist to be the lead uh, giver or philanthropist on a cause. Uh, in many cases, you know, let's say if you, if you think about the giving pledge, the folks who are involved there, in many cases it's not about the money necessarily, they have money to give. They want to be seen 
to fundamentally have a cause and a case that's attached to their name. And so uh, here potentially is an opportunity to go to someone as a lead, a lead donor and say, would you pay the interest on these bonds? Because if you do, your name will forever be associated with, uh, with Tigger. I think that's about it. Thanks to our group. Great discussion. Okay, we are a part of group two. <clears throat> and uh, I'm just going to simply tell you what the assignment is. It's called Keeping Up with the Joneses, Constructing an Environmental Portfolio. So we have some clients, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, who recently inherited a $500 million trust from um, a relative. And it's a fairly traditionally managed um, uh, asset base today, which includes significant exposure to fossil fuels, um, high carbon uh, assets, including oil and gas um, focused private equity funds. So the Joneses are committed to impact investing, specifically on tackling climate change and resilience. Uh, they are interested in renewable energy. They want to move their investment portfolio to a um, essentially zero climate emissions portfolio as quickly as possible. Um, they're willing to do clean tech and renewable investment opportunities. At the same time, um, they're interested in climate resilience and environmental justice. They also want their portfolio conservatively managed and diversified and investment grade. They um, are considering turning their trust into a family foundation, which would imply 5% would be given out to charitable causes on an annual basis. And the question before us is how would we advise the Joneses? And the answer is? So as a group, we decided on, I think it's a, a five point plan in terms of how this transition would happen. Uh, so first, it's important that the client engages in some type of self-exploration. So really understanding what are their long-term goals, what are their values, and importantly, what's the structure gonna look like? So uh, Bill mentioned that there is a possibility that they could place our assets into some type of foundation. We would talk through what that foundation looks like. Would you staff it up programmatically? Would you make program-related investments? What would be the mission? Uh, of that foundation. So we talked a lot about what the goals would be, what the structure of the investment vehicle would be. So that is sort of step one. Step two would be creating your, your team. So finding your quarterback. So for example, finding advisors who could thoughtfully transition uh, assets over to a low carbon portfolio. For example, if you're trying to create a foundation, engaging attorneys, attending networking events like this to get a sense of what your peers are doing. So understanding where you're going and using others kind of as, as a roadmap. Uh, and then third, kind of creating a plan for what that transition will look like. So we talked about beginning with your sort of low hanging fruit. So there, for example, there are certain assets, so asset classes that are easier to transition in a low carbon manner. So for example, starting with your public equities, starting with your fixed income, that's a good place to start if you're trying to reduce your exposure to long-term climate risk. Then over time, you can start to work in other riskier asset classes like venture capital, private debt, private equity, things that are focused more more on sort of early stage venture capital, uh, sorry, early stage venture capital focused on clean technology, energy efficiency, uh, sustainable real assets, investing in things like sustainable timber, clean infrastructure. So over time, working those type of assets into, uh, into the portfolio. And then finally, the final step would be creating some type of feedback loop to ensure that you are accomplishing the goals of that transition. So identifying key metrics. So for example, the energy intensity of your portfolio, the water intensity of your portfolio and kind of constantly communicating them so you can evaluate progress towards those goals. So that's kind of our, our plan. for our case study. Um, this said we had, there were six institutional investors who were willing to invest initially $250 million into a strategy or a team or a platform, um, but they wanted to eventually take that initial investment and syndicate it out 
to a bunch of other institutional investors who were not impact oriented, even though these initial six were impact oriented. Um, and then there are a bunch of parameters. Um, they wanted us to use the capital to make the largest positive impact on the environment possible while attaining attractive above market risk adjusted returns, charging very little in the way of fees, <laughs> and we could not be a first time fund. Um, so uh, the, we did have a couple of advantages to think about. One of them was we were able to raise PRI money to help us leverage our investment somehow. And um, we had a, an investment management uh, firm that had experience and team members who was willing to sponsor our platform if, if, if that was something we decided would be necessary. And the question is, what are we going to propose to these initial six investors to do with their $250 million? Um, and so what, the way we broke this down was we started thinking about, okay, the first goal is, how do we have the largest positive impact on the environment? And that's actually a really interesting conversation, and we spent a lot of time there. And the question was, you know, kind of by sector, is it oceans, forest, energy, water, food, transportation? Of course, the answer is all of the above. Um, but how do, how do you address that, and how do you measure that? Because we have obviously want to not only make a positive impact, but be able to demonstrate that, in fact, we did do that. Um, and then how do we do that? Well, finding an investment strategy that is scalable, and so we thought about, like, energy efficiency has a great uh, environmental bang for the buck, but it's, it's hard to get massive scale in energy efficiency. So we talked about how real estate could be a component of that. Uh, and we talked about public equities, because you can make an impact through active um, shareholders of public companies. And we, we liked the idea of coming into companies, and maybe public companies, because it's scalable, and changing their behavior. And as we kind of talked about that, that kind of gelled around an investment strategy, which is the following. This is our recommendation to these six investors. But we wanted them to invest initially $250 million into a, a portfolio that's sponsored by this experienced team. And it's going to be a, uh, a buyout, a private equity fund. And so our team is an experienced buyout private equity firm. And we're gonna bring in some additional expertise to help us on our asset selection. But the strategy is going, and what we're gonna take 250 million, we're gonna syndicate it out to a billion dollars. So we've got a billion dollar private equity fund. And what we're gonna do as a strategy is um, look for large emitters of CO2, transportation companies, steel, steel refineries, uh, mining companies, companies that really are kind of the bad actors. And we're gonna use our private equity fund to buy those private companies and we're gonna quantify their carbon footprint. Then we're gonna take about five to 10% of the billion dollars as our, as our uh, venture capital bucket. And we're going to make sure that the companies that provide the solutions to reduce the emissions of those, uh, those companies, we wanna invest in those companies and hold a meaningful stake in those firms. To the extent that there is still risk in those technology companies, we're gonna use our PRI money to come in and sort of de-risk those tech companies. Then we come in with our venture capital money, buy out the big emitters, and change the behavior of those big emitters by deploying those clean technologies into the big companies. So we now have a large company that has better behavior, and we can quantify the reduction in their CO2 emissions from the old tech to the new tech. But also, we have just made our new venture capital portfolio the dominant clean technology company, and now they're gonna to start to reach out to all the other market participants now that they're installed in the largest sector, and we're gonna get a nice pop inside our PE fund from our VC investments. So come back next year, and we're gonna have PPMs for all of you guys. We're raising a billion dollars. We got the first 250 million, but it's not gonna last long. But thank you.